So hello again from lovely Munich. Hello from Germany. I'm very happy to speak here about the coronavirus and how it really impacts almost everything in the supply chains and value chains across the world. The coronavirus is a bit like this. It's a bit like an avalanche, a black swan event that comes and almost hits and destroys everything in its way. And I went to a couple of these avalanche courses and there's one thing they teach you and this is don't panic. Watch what happens, observe and then act upon this. Instead, you should be much more like this. Almost meditating, observing and calmly making the right decisions. And it all centers around this. Do you have a problem? No. Well, so why worry? You don't have a problem, but more likely you're going to say, yes, yes, I do have a problem. Can you do something about it? Yes, I can change it. I can change. I can act. So I worry. But unfortunately, the corona crisis is here, right? So can you do something about it? No, not really. But so why worry? Observe what's happening. Understand it and then act upon this. And this is what the, this presentation is about. We at ARC really think there are these three steps uh, which everyone should face right now. It's like first understand what is going on. Second, anticipate what will happen next and then act upon the understanding as well of the current market as well as on the future likely events and developments. And this is a very rough summary and I understand that most of you, all of you, will follow the daily press, so I won't go into too much details. But let's just summarize very quickly. We started in in China. Um, first cases were reported in uh, November, but basically by February 2020, it was an outbreak, it was a pandemic. It spread across the world. Um, by April, mainly Europe were discussion topics as well as once the Iran. And by August, um, really Brazil, US, Russia and India are among the key focus countries in terms of the outbreak. We still have little spread in Africa. Uh, we, and this is the state, um, is we have no vaccine available, no proven vaccine. Um, we don't have any medication available. And honestly, the spread depends on government measures. We also see that in selected countries, the second waves have started a lot, um, especially in Europe, depends on the travel activities. And again, the hotspots that we currently have. So for next, I want to focus a bit on the spread depends on government measures. And what you see here on this chart is, of course, the date on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, we index the peak outbreak in terms of new infections on a single day, indexed it to 100 and uh, put everything else into relation to each other. And you see South Korea was hit quite early, uh, very decisive measures and hence a very, very sharp drop in new infection rates. Look at Italy. In Italy, probably got it later, but probably was a bit surprised um, and had a lot of new infections quite early. They had very decisive measures, but the say the width of the peak here was quite wide compared to South Korea. And also the then the number of new infections takes a bit a, a less steeper slope downwards. Then you have the UK also a couple of days and in this case already month after after uh, Korea had their peak. We had the peak in the UK. Um, the government sort of ignored it for a while um, until they did actually did something. That's why we have a very broad peak and then also the, the slope downwards wasn't that steep. And then of course we have the world leader in Corona infections, the United States of America. Uh, we had a first, so to speak, peak in April, that was basically the New York peak, then it went down a bit, there were quite decisive actions, and then the virus spread in the broad country in a, a lot of states, and then we had the peak, and again, not very decisive measures, and we have a quite broad peak. And when you look at the strategies towards virus, it we had 
strict lockdown in a couple of countries. We have countries that focused on testing. Uh, Japan, as far as to my knowledge, has the strategy to follow the spreaders. This is a bit different than the other ones, but also um, a very effective strategy. Um, Netherlands and Sweden actually strategically did something called herd immunity, which turned out not to be that brilliant, but um, at least that was their plan. And I would quite frankly say Brazil, UK and US and as well as some other emerging countries um, don't have a really decisive actions and strategy. Um, these are not my personal interpretations or, or findings, but they um, there's actually a um, source here. You can click the link, you get, get the slides. And this actually measures political stringency and how things develop. So if you are interested and if you're forecasting the future development of the virus, you have to look at the medical treatment or the vaccination, and you have to look at the government measures. And this, what I show you just now, this shows how much the government measures really matter. And so the next slide, I want to show a bit what we have learned from past crisis. And one thing is, and the picture here is from the Spanish flu outbreak, um, and already they uh, focused on wearing masks. Um, there were different kind of masks. It seems like this is more the, let's say the hip mask, probably quite more expensive than just a paper mask, that, which was also used back then. But what else can we learn from the Spanish flu? First, beware of the second wave. There was around one year between the first and second outbreak and the second wave was much, much more severe. Um, the second lesson was socioeconomic parameters determine the mortality rate. Uh, in other words, the poor die first and more frequent. That is true between the countries, but also within a country. Um, very sad statistics, but already in the current crisis proven correct again. And the third one is don't panic. Again, I uh, think, think back of the avalanche, but watch the facts. So the Spanish flu is called Spanish flu, not because it Spanish has like the biggest outbreak or anything, but be, back then it was the times of the, of the World War I. Um, and during that war, also information was critically censored and but Spain was among the most open to communicate. So back then everyone assumed it was the most severe in Spain. So really try to watch the facts. Um, then what can we learn from the SARS outbreak at 2002, 2003, um, also in China, but back then China was much less integrated to the global economy, uh, value chains. Uh, in this case, really the panic caused more disruption than the actual crisis. It was contained quite easily not that big of a problem, but the panic caused some shortages in some supply chains. We have the financial crisis. Um, everyone still remembers it around 11 years ago. Um, and if you, if you rethink that, um, Northern Rock went bankrupt in 2007. It hit manufacturing in 2009. So we almost had two years of warning lights going on and saying something's coming, something's coming. Um, well, uh, this year we had a couple of weeks a month. Uh, what we learned was that first, um, it's very important to stabilize consumer demand, and we have this now in Europe in place. Uh, not only the, let's say, standard unemployment insurance and things like that, but also the short work weeks, and they really help. Uh, we learned that excessive government interventions can cause excess capacities, which then caused another crisis in 1516 when we had the cement, mining, and metals over capacities predominantly in China. And commodity prices can go crazy. Back then, oil prices peaked. Um, this time, oil prices went negative, and gold prices in both of the cr crises uh, went through the roof. Um, well, we, we learned that, and that seems to be quite a rule now. Um, and there were other crises, and later I'll link to a more detailed webcast on that, um, which caused supply chain disruption, but and actually destroyed certain aspects of the supply chain, like the flooding in Thailand hit the hard disk drive um, production globally, 
um, the, the the big Japanese earthquake, which caused the Fukushima catastrophe in 2011, um, obviously also had big effects on the on the nuclear phase out that was um, speed up in Germany. It also a big share of the global semiconductor industry was destroyed, and Hurricane Katrina, which destroyed 20% or so of the U.S. capacity in in oil and gas production and refining. But even when those disasters destroyed the production equipment, the recovery of the supply side was quite fast. And typically, most of the stuff went back online after three, four, five months. But it had long run effects. Um, so I mentioned the nuclear phase out of Germany. Um, it also had effects on pushing shale gas um, in the US. It was diversification, not only in energy, um, in the energy market, but also in the uh, semiconductor electronics and automotive industry, which diversified their value chains. Now, this is the situation that, like the, from the say top level view, and with the next slides, I want to show real data. Um, we've done very uh, good job over the last weeks and months to streamline our calculation. Now we're able to almost in real time show you things like this. This is our automation index. Um, it shows you in summary the aggregated revenues of automation companies. Okay, and you see here the drop in Q1, Q2, this is the latest data. We look at publicly listed companies and we have around minus 12 here, um, which I'm very happy to say because I felt forecasted for Q2 minus 14 back in February. So um, this is a good one. And so we see this impact here and it basically follows a similar pattern. It's not as severe as we had it in 2009. It's significantly more severe than here in 2015-16 when the oil prices dipped and we had the overcapacity. But overall, yes, there is um, quite strong contract contraction of the markets and we can measure it. Um, also, some industries already suffered in the second half of 2019, especially the automotive markets where we have the, the structural change from internal combustion engine to um, e-cars. Um, and all, all industries are right now equally affected. Some go quite well through the crisis. And we also have um, a lagging index. The North American index was quite good still in Q1, but by Q2 has the biggest contraction. And we actually see on a more granular level that Asia is already stabilizing. And this was the automation side. Now, Let's take a look at the machine side. So moving up basically in the in the value chain. Um, what you see here is the year over year growth. Um, the darkest green is minus 20, the darkest red is um, darkest green is plus 20, the darkest red is minus 20. And what we do is year over year growth. So we compare Q114 with Q113. We have all ARC standard machine types that we monitor and for um, to make interpretation a bit easier we go from left to right so left is heavy process and the right is really the discrete and the chop shop manufacturing of machine tools all right so what you see here are the oil and gas commodity crisis which affected this one we already mentioned that you see the the big boom in in robotics you can actually mo monitor for semiconductor and electronics. You have this highly cyclical character, character of the industry. Um, you have the food and beverage industry, which is overall quite stable compared to packaging, which actually is much more dynamic and grows a bit faster. And to summarize everything, we have this one. But if you look at all of these individual explanations, what happens here, 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 and uh, further down, the corona crisis almost affects all the industries. And the only two exceptions are right now semiconductor and electronics, which did not really cut down their spending. So from a machine builder perspective, almost everything is 
affected already. And especially that what I mentioned earlier, in the machine tool industry, we had the crisis already and the automotive industry here, where spendings turned down in Q2 2019, and then basically the corona crisis comes on top of it. So, hmm, poor persons of the machine tool industry, but it will certainly go up again. If we aggregate that to the top level, uh, you see this here. So you see the two quarters being negative in Q1, Q2, and this is roughly by minus 10%. So it's roughly in line with the automation revenue. So it fits it quite well. It's a very consistent picture. When you look at the capex here, and this is the capex of I think the 500 to 600 largest publicly listed manufacturing companies, the capex is surprisingly stable. Now, are they taking it serious? Do they put uh, take the measures next year? I, hard to say. Really, we, we read all these annual reports. So in the end, there's one question. Where is my bullwhip effect? So all the effects that we learned in the past that we can observe over the last years, here, 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 it's not working anymore. Where Where is it? And uh, we spent some quite some time arguing about this and we had a similar situation the end of last year in, space, in the automotive market. We had the same like machine going down, automation going down, the capex and revenue is almost stable. And we did, um, we asked a smart person to write a master thesis about it. And he did a survey and he figured out this. 60% of the companies in times of great economic stress drive innovation. They either strongly agree or they agree. Um, only a very small percentage disagree. So times of economic stress are times of innovation. So in our point of view, users keep investing, but not in machinery, but in digitization. And this is why we see that Corona will have an impact far beyond, far beyond everything that a financial crisis may have. The investments are there, but they don't go to machines. They end up in software, they end up in digitization projects. And this is why the automation index with all the PLCs and the DCSs and flow meters and position is, is, is quite more volatile than the current capital expenditures as we see in the market. Um, all right, so this is our, this is the status quo of the data right now. And when we extrapolate from this, um, a bit further and we, we have our scenarios of what will come next. We, we basically work with uh, four scenarios um, right now. We developed them back in April or April, March, uh, April, May, and they're still valid more or less. So um, what we see most plausible for global automation markets, so really automation markets overall, everything from, again, sensor level up to MES, and PLM, this is what we see the most um, plausible, right? So we see the dip here with around any everything between minus 10 to minus 15 percent. Then we have a recovery in 2021, and then we uh, say smoothly go back to the long run growth, which is anywhere between three and four percent. In case the, we have a vaccination and everything but at the end of 2020 and we can master the virus also 2020 will be a bit more positive but also then we have a, a little bit bigger peak here and will will also settle quite fast back to normal growth if we have a second wave that means especially during winter times in the northern hemisphere the virus breaks out we have more shutdowns this will drop economic growth further in 2020 and then also we have this recovery here um, by the way when you take sort of a ruler here in the peak of 2019 
you'll see the big difference is that we actually believe that in 2021, we almost reach 2019 level, but we finally will go back to 2019 level in 2022. And when you have it here, that's also the forecast of the automation index, but in this case, it's basically the blue curve here, but quarterly, you'll see the dip here. So the biggest drop we'll expect in Q3 2020. Again, this is the understanding. We now know where we expect the dip to be, when it will happen. And we also basically proven that there, there will be that shift. The coronavirus will change much, much more than just be a quick dip in revenues. And especially the mid to long term, it should be addressed now. So based on this anticipation, what action should you take and what else do we expect to change far from, uh, besides the, the dip in revenues and this is we expect business models to change more towards equipment as a service we expect a diversification of the value chains again we happened that that happened before uh, in a lot of areas we expect also linked to diversification of value chains uh, a sort of renationalization that means a lot of manufacturing goes back to the developed world, which will trigger increase in robots and also uh, less demand for, let's say, global logistics. Um, medical and pharmaceuticals, um, obviously there is a boom right now, also in investment, ramp up capacities, but beware of the overcapacities. Think of China and mining metal, cement 2015-16. Um, we expect automation companies to search new markets like battery manufacturing, farming, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, but also then the competition in these markets will increase. We have an increasing demand in ur urban precision and vertical farming, and a couple of technologies will really be pushed by the COVID-19 crisis. First, as much as possible should be done remotely, and while not everything will continue over time, um, this trend will more or less continue. Much more will be done remote than any of us could have imagined in 2018 and 19. This also is linked to an increase in augmented as well as virtual reality to speed up training, reduce uh, on-site number of people, and also to support maintenance stuff remotely. We have the area of cloud-based software. We have the digital twin, which again is, can be used for virtual commissioning and support of maintenance, which again means less people on the floor, more potential for remote. Additive manufacturing for spare parts, the whole area of transparency and traceability. So everything from, from the cloud-based software to the, to the switches and routers and gateways, everything of this, and all the area of edge controllers, which include that connectivity and edge analytics capability in the same device as they um, have real-time control. And then, now what should you do now? This is the anticipation. This is the economic anticipation, the technolo technological anticipation. Now you need to act. And obviously you need to do, you need to prepare for these long-run trends now, and I'm pretty sure most of you are already working on this. What we also want to highlight, we looked at 2009, the financial crisis, and look which companies were doing particularly well. Um, and as users and, and machine builders, we thought their automation strategies, and also proven by our survey, that meant the companies which were top leading edge technology companies by then, they gained market share in the long run, not next year, but in a four, five, six, seven year horizon. Companies with a focus on hybrid, so uh, food and beverage and pharma, as well as utilities, they lost less revenues. They, they were more stable during the crisis. That doesn't mean they, they gained market share in the long run, but during the crisis, they were more stable and companies with less shareholder value pressure, they gained share. Um, either they were not publicly listed, um, they were privately held, or um, often the state it was a, a larger owner of these companies and they had less pressure, they could keep the, the, the staff up and then be ready for a kickstart. So they, they gained from this. 
We learned again that excess government spendings can cause um, excess capacities. A lot of companies focused on diversification afterwards, and they did a lot of that. Them did this also by M&A mergers and acquisition. And these mergers and acquisition typically take place at the first phase of the of the recovery. Um, which you can see here after the financial crisis, here after the commodity crisis, it's significantly lower as it actually affected much less companies because a lot of companies won't survive and people diversify and get into these new technologies. That's it from my side. I want to thank you all very, very much. Um, I have three more things I would quickly like to mention. This is, we did a detailed webcast on the past crises uh, back in March. Um, so not uh, on, the, on SARS, on the Tohoku earthquake and others. You can click the link, it's publicly available on, on YouTube. We have a detailed, um, more detailed Corona outlook presentation we made in May. Again, our forecast proven to be quite accurate, at least for Q2. So um, you can access this. Um, it's actually for ARC clients only, but you're welcome to, to have a look. And I also would like to invite you to the yours, to join European uh, Sentiment Survey, which is a survey which takes around one minute, asks three simple questions. How are you doing? How are you doing compared to next? And how will you will do ne uh, next month? So very quick survey. Um, you can either take your smartphone, make a picture with a QR code, or later click on that link to participate. You will receive the survey results once it's done. So again, thank you. Thank you for participating.